All right, guys, I want to talk a little bit about the live scope. I know it's been said that uh, in some aspects, live scope is ruining fishing and that uh, big fish are getting caught and they're dying because uh, they're getting, you know, mishandled and abused and all this kind of stuff. And some people seem to think that um, by having a live scope that, you know, you don't have to have any fishing skills anymore. You just go out there, find the fish, catch the fish, you spotlight the fish. and well, I'm just long and short of it, they have a lot of negative things to say about a live scope. And, you know, maybe some of that stuff is true. Um, I, as an avid fisherman and a person who've had live scope for a little over a year now, maybe about a year and a half, maybe it's going on closer to two years, um, I'll have to say that uh, it hasn't turned me into a world class fisherman just because I have a live scope. Um, but the things that live scope will help you do is uh, find the fish. Uh, I mean, so does, you know, 2D, down imaging, side imaging, but now we have something that we can look at underwater in real time, especially with perspective boat, and you can see those fish swimming around, chasing bait. Like this last weekend, um, I mean, you know, you would have thought with it being so windy and the temperature dropping by six degrees in some places that those fish would be shut down, that you'd have to use small baits, a lot of guys still seeing hitting the banks. There weren't many people out there because it was just so cold and windy. And I was reading my butt off. In fact, I found the fish. They're in the same general area I've been fishing. And they were large schools of bait. The bait is getting, the schools are getting bigger. It's getting more dense. And it looked like something out of National Geographic where I could watch the fish literally swim into these schools of bait. And the bait spread. And these fish going around chasing the bait. And uh, I'll get to that more as far as the technique that I'm going to be using this next weekend. And hopefully... That same pattern is, or you know, pattern, whatever. Fish are still doing that, and I got a couple techniques that I'm gonna use. One was suggested to me by uh, somebody who'd seen one of my videos or saw my video from last week, and um, and that's a jerk bait. And also the other one I'm gonna be throwing is a um, is going back to the old umbrella rig, and I'll talk a little bit about the rod and reel that I use for that. Um, I haven't thrown it in a while, but this time is definitely from what I saw on my live scope this last weekend where those fish are chasing schools of bait like that. And I mean, groups of fish moving quick. Like I've said, they're still out there. And, um, actually they moved out even further from five to 15. They're now out there in that 20 foot of water over the deep channels. And in fact, I saw a lot of big arcs down there on the bottom in 21 foot of water in the main river channel. Now those could have been catfish, those could have been gar, those could have been, um, you know, any number of species of fish, uh, obviously catfish, gar, carp, something like this, um, being how big they were. Um, but I saw a lot of fish out there, a lot of fish moving from that 10 to 15 feet out to that deeper water, chasing bait, going back shallow. I saw on the crankbait, didn't really get much on the crankbait. Um, they didn't hit the fluke like they hit the weekend before. I went and looked in other parts of the lake, ended up catching a couple of fish going up shallow just because there's um, a little area that I know of that generally the fish, like I said, hang out there year round. Um, those fish are real skinny, uh, obviously not doing well because they, they resident fish. They just stay there and stay shallow, which we, you will have. But um, from what I saw, the fish that are staying shallow aren't doing real, real well. I actually caught one fish on a jigging spoon, caught it in the tail, snagged it. Um, about a two pounder, real white, milky, milky looking fish. And that's a fish that stays out there in the deep water, but it was nice and fat. That tail was fat. And so obviously those offshore fish are doing a lot better because that's where most of the bait is. And that's kind of what I went over last weekend about, you know, a lot of guys fishing wrong because they're beating the banks still. And the fish are starting up on the banks, except for a few scattered fish that are just, that's what they do. They stay on the banks year round. That's just where they are. Um, and if you want to go and catch those fish after six other guys have hit that same stretch of bank and hit that same point and hit that same secondary cove and so on, be my guess. But uh, to me, I try to fish the odds and try to look for the fish uh, using the live scope, using my side imaging, even my, I run my TV and mapping and my live scope all three at the same time when I'm offshore a lot of times because that allows me to see the fish. And you can call that spotlighting or not, but being able to see the fish, I equate similar to when you go hunting. You know, you can't shoot the deer unless you see them. You know, how do you expect to catch fish if you can't see them? And for years and years and years, we've been out there fishing blind. Now we have some a tool that allows us to see the fish, see underwater, see fishing behavior, learn for ourselves, not have to go off of what everybody else is telling us. And a lot of times they're telling you something wrong, not because they're lying to you, but because they're telling you from their point of view, uh, from their experience and they hadn't been able to see under the water 
And be honest, they're just guessing. And they were giving you their best guess. Well, now we don't have to guess. We can use a live scope. Um, and as far as, you know, the price of a live scope, yep, it's cost prohibitive. Uh, I spent about three grand on mine. Um, and, um, you know, that's up to you if you want to spend that kind of money. Uh, on it, I went and got one with the 10 inch screen because I figured if I was going to get one, I want to get one that I could see, you know, obviously reading glasses. Um, and so, um, no, the live scope's not going to destroy fishing. I think it enhances it. Um, and I think you still need to have all the same um, knowledge that, I mean, if you go back to like, you know, structure fishing with Wood Daves, you know, go back to the days of. Um, you know, structure fishing with Roland Martin and where he tells, teaches you about triangulating the point where he teaches about throwing out marker buoys, marking the center channel and all that kind of stuff. All that kind of knowledge is still good. I still recommend going back and seeing those old uh, structure videos because um, there's a lot of stuff that they talk about that still applies today even with the use of the live scope. Uh, and that's why I like to talk more about, you know, fishing patterns in the underwater realm as opposed to just just talking about bait because in my opinion a lot of times the lure is the last part of the equation and so many guys focus on that and put it on the front part of their video and um i think that's really misleading you know trying to get you hyped up on fishing a certain technique instead of getting you more um thinking about what are the fish doing and then once i figure out what the fish are doing what technique and approach can i be used that best works for that situation and presentation and um, and as I was saying, the thing I'm going to start off with probably in that scenario where those fish are chasing those big schools of bait and watching them running around like that is, you guessed it, umbrella rig. Now this umbrella rig I've had is one of them young umbrella rigs and I got to set up as you see the, it's kind of, you know, darkened and stuff like that. I don't think that would be a big deal. Um, I'll just spray it with some garlic spray here and uh, I'll be good to go. Um, the rod that I got it on is a 7 foot uh, 10 heavy power rod. It's a Bass X rod. It's actually a flipping stick with an extra long handle. And this is a pretty heavy bait. You see all these little quarter ounce weights on there. Um, and it's 20 pound test line is what I'm using. And there again, I'd use that hybrid line. You know, that goes every hybrid line, 20 pound test. Heck, I've even thrown 30 pound test because you stick a tree with it and bye bye it's about a 30 dollar uh you know by the time you buy this and buy the little weights and the with the you know little um uh, flukes or whatever you want to call them uh it's about 30 bucks you know i do have a cheaper brand that i use uh where did i put it it's not as successful um for whatever reason i got as a backup and those, uh, those are those man, um, their saltwater baits that I got on. This is an off-brand knockoff that I use to keep as a backup. And I've got quite a few of them because I got them for like $6.99 a piece. And I've got a few fish with them. I got, uh, you know, I always keep uh, several of them as a backup. This brand right here, Blisswell. But I think the Yum brand works a little bit better. And, uh, and so, yeah, I'm going to go out there and that's going to be the one thing I'm going to use, the live scope. And follow those schools of bait, making really long casts. Corey got my aura ranch on there. And uh, making really long casts and going after those fish, chasing after those schools in that open water. And that's why, yes, you can use it with the pen. I got the perspective uh, mount, so you can have perspective mode on your live scope. And yeah, you can go out there and you can cruise around, you can follow those big schools, making big long casts into those schools and try to catch those fish. So that's one of the that's going to be one of the techniques that I'm going to be trying. And the other thing is something somebody suggested me, and that was the jerk bait. And <clears throat> although he recommended me doing a Mega Bass 110, which I do have some, I've got some Jackal Reed Ranges. I've got some, this is a flash pointer. I've got, um, I've, you know, I've, I've got quite a few different jerk baits. I've got a whole box of them and stuff. Uh, he suggested 10 pound test line. I don't like going that light. Um, just I broke off fish on 12 pound test and that's what I got on here. It got me some 12 pound test. You know, it's a, um, it's, this is a, it's a seven foot, uh, six medium heavy, but it's a 13 fishing rod. And to me, these light, they're, they're rods seem to be kind of light as far as when you bend them and flex them. Um, it's a pretty rip, whippy rod. I mean, for, for it being called medium heavy, it feels more like a medium to me, honestly. Um, but anyhow, but that's what I'm going to be using with this, uh, with this jerk bait here and same with the jerk baits i still like using that little snap i always like to talk about 
uh, just because that way you can change through baits. If this one doesn't work, then I can try another one. Just keep going through until I find one that does work. There again, I'm, this one's blue and kind of greenish on the back. It's flash pointer. And um, I've caught, I've caught yeah, several fish on this. I mean, in one day, probably had 10 fish on this bait alone. Nothing really big or spectacular, but it works. So that's what I'm going to start with. Like I said, I got some Jackal re-ranges and some more other flash pointers. Got some other brands, H2 Express brand. Um, I can't remember all the different names and stuff like that. But um, so that is going to be another one. Same thing, going after those fish that are chasing those schools, making long casts, jerking it, working it back. And because, uh, like I said, the crankbait, the deep diving crankbait and stuff just didn't get bit at all this past weekend. Um, but I'm still going to have those tied on. Just you never know; they may change. You may get out there thinking, okay, this technique's going to work that's going to work and you get out there and for whatever reason those fish have you know they're not doing that you know like i said this is a technique that i saw because of what they were doing last weekend i'm going to go out there set up for it in hopes that i'll find them still doing the same thing and that's one thing i found with fishing generally when you kind of figure out what they're doing they'll continue to do the same thing for eh, a week two weeks sometimes maybe three weeks and then the season will change as the water starts getting cooler, as we start getting into you know January and February, maybe they'll move out into that center channel and they'll go down to the bottom and they'll sit down in the bottom of that center channel when the water's really cold, about 40 degrees. Um, you'll find those fish literally finding a hard spot like uh, where it's you know got limestone, not mud. They don't like sitting in mud or sandy bottoms. They like sandy bottoms or like a hard rocky bottom or a limestone bottom in those channels. Um, I could even name some spots, but I won't. Um, I don't like giving up spots. Um, but um, areas where I found that there's rock and shell and you can find these areas like when you're throwing that deep diving crankbait and you can feel it digging into that bottom and it's a rocky you know substrate um, when it gets cold real cold those fish will get down there and they'll literally sit with their bellies on the bottom um, I don't think we're at that point yet some guys who are up north and stuff like that but yeah don't uh, don't discount the main river channel um, not at all. In fact, sometimes you'll find some big ones sitting out there. And how you find them, you can find them on, uh, especially on 2D. Uh, and what you'll find is you'll go in the, work in the main river channels and those bass will be sitting on the bottom. And the way, the only difference you tell between it and a rock is looking at your 2D and you can see just the slightest little separation between that little bump on the bottom and the bottom. Now, it, if you're going over a rock, it's just a hump. And it's connected to the bottom. There is no separation. Sometimes you'll even have those fish where it looks like that, where you just see an arc on the bottom, and there is no separation. And it's literally just a bass or a fish that's sitting just on the bottom because the water's so cool, cold. That's what they do. Because yeah, sometimes you notice when that water gets really cold, you notice there's just no bait. There's just nothing moving. That lake just looks completely empty. Well, sometimes that's where they're at. They're in those deep hollows, and they're just sitting there on the bottom because um, the water's cold and they're just, you know, they're just sitting there surviving. And so um, that's kind of where we're headed uh, as this water continues. I'm actually fortunate one because I live in central Texas and uh, we got a lot of power plant lakes. So a lot of these power plant lakes, the um, they never get cold enough to where the fish will do that. Um, on non-power plant lakes, yes, that's where you're going to find them where they'll get where just absolutely, you know, out there in that deep river channel and just doing nothing. Uh, and that's where I'm working real slow, maybe a Carolina rig, maybe that uh, drop shot, um, you know, working a jig really slow, or maybe a, a swim bait, working it real slow on those bottom, in the bottom um, out there. You know, so, and always look for, especially like where two creeks meet, like where you got the main river channel, channel coming in. A lot of times those are good spots to find for those fish sitting out there in the bottom. I mean, I'm thinking of one that uh, I remember, it was one of the biggest fish I caught in a tournament. I caught it that way. Um, and um and i ended up getting big bass that year too uh on that fish and it, i mean it was 28 degrees when we left the boat ramp that morning it was december 8th of i want to say 2013 so that put 10 years ago anyhow um but uh yeah that's it for this episode um like i said uh live scope it ain't the end of the world it isn't going to turn you into uh take you from just an average or an avid fisherman, above average, I guess, whatever, tournament angler, and turn you into, you know, overnight success. Um, there still takes that learning to figure out what will get those fish to bite. Um, and 
Finding fish is key. I don't care if you're using 2D, I don't care if you're in a kayak and you're just looking over the side, looking for bass chasing on the surface, looking for bait splashing around on the surface, um, whatever it may be, you know, find the bait first and then look for the fish second. And then when you find the fish, then you try to figure out what technique works. And a lot of times, go through a process of elimination. Don't, don't just go out there with one idea in mind and oh, well that didn't work and move on. I mean, there's a lot of times I'll work a spot and I'll see somebody will come in in front of me, fish in front of me, go all the way down across and around, and then turn around and leave, and I'm still working that same spot. And the reason being is because I'm losing, using my electronics. I'm seeing those fish, and it's like, okay, I know these fish are here. So I just need to figure out, now that i found the fish, now I need to figure out how to catch these fish. And, um, and sometimes it can produce really well. Sometimes you can have those 15, 20 fish uh, days off of one spot. Like I said, my best ever is uh, 35 fish off one spot on a shaky head. Windy point, it was like last weekend, it was real windy. It wasn't so cold. That was one thing, too, why I moved off of those fish is where I found them. is out in the main river channel off of a point. But that wind coming across there, I don't know if y'all were out there um, this, this Sunday. Man, it was howling out there. And it was, I mean, even with my rain suit on and I had my thermals underneath, I was still freezing. I was just like, I couldn't stay on them. It was just too dang cold. I want you to know, but uh, I'm going to go back ready, all rigged up, and uh, still got my other crankbaits and other things that I'm going to use. Um, I may even go up shallow. I mean, if it's another day where it's so windy like that. In fact, we're going to have rain tonight. We're going to have rain tomorrow, um, which could change everything. Uh, that's the thing is we get a, you know all day of rain tomorrow and a little bit of rain the next day and really drop that temp water temp even more. It may just completely change everything. I don't know until I get out there. Um so anyhow, that's this week's episode. Um, like I said, most important things always go and have a good time and hope that helps you all. For those who subscribed, I had about 20 something subscribers this week. Man, I was really enthused. Uh, my last video did really good. I just want to say thanks to all you guys and hopefully I'm giving y'all some decent information and um, maybe some of you more experienced guys are probably looking at me and laughing. I don't know, but I'm just passing on what little knowledge that I accumulated over the years and um, thanks for watching. See you on the next.